friends. So I have been renovating my glaze room like crazy with the intention that it would become this week's video. I thought I could get it done in a week <laughs> and it just ended up being clearly very impossible and that wouldn't have made it in time for today's video. <laughs> so what I decided to do is just a Q&A video, but because I feel like this is the ultimate act of narcissism to just talk about yourself for a while, I'm also going to throw some Christmas trees because tis the season, or at least in my world. So these Christmas trees, these are not a completely original design. Obviously I'm going to put my own spin on it. So <laughs> I wasn't sure how to do this, so I actually typed up your questions because um, I didn't want to be handling my phone while I'm having my hands full of clay. So let me just get started with a tree and then I'll answer the first question. I am throwing off the hump. Um, okay, so the first question, actually a bunch of people asked this and I guess it's because I'm currently renovating and I was posting about it over on Instagram. By the way, I got these questions from Instagram. A bunch of people asked me on Instagram about my landlord and my renting situation. Um, like, is he compensating me for all of these materials? He's not. So he did a lot of the um, renovations himself, actually, to the main rooms. So short answer is no, he's not compensating me. Um, but that was basically part of the rental contract. Like, that was the deal. Um, and I think the reason we got this house is because we were okay with that. I thought it was a great deal. I kind of want to make them a little wonky. Like, I'm trying to, like knock them over a little bit. <laughs> so I was looking at houses thinking the best deal we could possibly get is like a row house. I'm just saying we had, we got a good deal. And the main thing though, is that we're planning on staying here for a long time. Like I have, eventually I want to buy my own house, but event, like I have no intention of leaving this house for at least the next five years. So it was kind of like a balance. Like we decided Okay, we'll front the cost on the renovation materials. We'll do it all ourselves so it's significantly cheaper, but we'll front the cost on that and then we'll save on rent. So I think we're gonna end up ahead, honestly, than like just renting a new unit. So yeah, that was the calculus of that. I mean, obviously I take into consideration the fact that I can do a lot of renovations. Um, I enjoy doing renovations and I also am very picky about like uh, interior design and like the, the type of place that I live. And yeah, finding a unit that had a basement where I could do my pottery, like a basement with a proper window and heating and everything, there was just so many benefits to this place. So if we have to do a little bit of renovation, I'm okay with it. That was very long-witted. I'm going to try and keep these short so I can get through as many as possible. I do, by the way, sort it through the questions and I have a bunch of like rapid fire questions that I'm going to get to at the end. So there were a bunch of questions about like, did I study ceramics? How did I choose my career path in ceramics? Do I make more money from social media or pottery? How did I become a, you know, a full-time potter? Things like that. Um, I'm just going to kind of give you guys the overview and hopefully <laughs> that's going to uh, answer some of your questions. So I did not go into this with the intention well, okay, maybe at the very beginning, I was like having these very romantic feelings about pottery um, and thought I could be a full-time potter. But come to find out, there's a lot of really successful potters on the internet that have day jobs. My point being that it's, it's a really hard life to make your money completely off pottery. Well, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, it's a really hard life and I want my life to be easy. <laughs> I don't want to live like, you know, I don't, I've been living paycheck to paycheck, paycheck basically my whole life. And I would love, as I mentioned, to buy a house someday. Um, so it was partially like a financial decision to not go 100% into pottery as my full-time job. Um, but if it wasn't for the second part of it, I probably would try anyway. The second part of it is that I genuinely don't want to. <laughs> so if I were to make pottery my full-time job, like making pots and selling them, pottery is my full-time job, but obviously I'm a teacher, right? Um, 
if I were to make making pottery my full-time job, I would be what we call a production potter. And these people sit at their wheel all day and make, 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 make. And to me, that's not fun. To me, I enjoy making pottery as a creative act. I don't necessarily enjoy the repetitive motions that it takes to make 500 of the same bowl. I get bored really quickly when it comes to making certain shapes and I always want to keep evolving and make new things. Um, so coming up with a collection and sticking to that collection for like, you know, to have repeat customers and all that stuff, that's just never appealed to me. It's never appealed to me. And more power to the people who do enjoy sitting at their wheel. It's just like not my thing. And um, I started teaching in 2017, I think at my first like shared studio in Berlin. And um, I really loved it. I mean, teaching, like anyone who's taught knows that teaching is fun, you know? Especially if you're teaching something that you genuinely love. Because I do genuinely love pottery. I just don't genuinely love making the same pieces over and over again. Like this stuff is fun for me. Um, okay, so I decided that I wanted to be a teacher and then Whoa. I founded the studio, like, so I had my first shared studio and then, well, first I was making stuff at home and taking them to a uh, potter for firing. And then I had my first shared studio and then I had what was supposed to be a shared studio, but then the other two people moved out. So that's when I had my first solo studio and that's when I started the memberships. And that was kind of, that was in Hohenschönhausen in Berlin. So that's like on the outskirts of Berlin. And that went really well. I was working like a mad woman. I can't believe how many hours I worked. And then I decided I needed to be more, more central because I was commuting like an hour and a half every day, uh, both ways. And uh, so I decided I needed to be closer to home. And also I wanted to add more classes and stuff so I could actually I, I knew it would work. So that's when like, you know, I, the rent I was gonna be paying was gonna be so much higher. Um, but I knew that it would work downtown. I had tried it out already and it was working. I moved to downtown. So I moved, my studio was in Vedding. It's actually still there. I sold everything to um, a good friend of mine, Charmin and his partner, Steffi. Um, and they're potters and they run it now and they're freaking awesome and I love them. But yeah, I just sold everything to them. They're getting a little squat. I need to make them taller. It's hard to do two things at once. <laughs> this is like, that leads actually perfect into um, the next element of that, which is why I moved out of Berlin. So the pandemic happened. I had the studio in Reading for three years, um, but during the pandemic I started <laughs> a desperation because the rent was very high. Um, but I started these take home clay kits and that's when I was like, okay, how do I make this possible? Like it was basically like, how do I market them? Like, how do I get people to buy them? Because I'm trying to put a class into a kit that you take home and I'm not there to teach you how to do it. So what I, what I decided to do along with the kits is I just made a couple of, I was planning for doing 10 of these kind of introductory um, videos, which are, by the way, still online. I might take them down at some point. So <laughs> if you want to see the very beginning of me on YouTube with my iPhone. So that happened. That's why I started a YouTube channel. I was literally just going to put a couple of tutorials up, but it was the timing of it all. With the pandemic, you know, everyone was going crazy and pottery was a huge outlet for people. I was basically, I just saw a lot of success on YouTube right away. Not even success that I can replicate now. Like it was crazy how many people were watching um, pottery videos on YouTube. And I'll be honest with you guys, this entire three years that I had this studio in Vedding, so the last studio I had in Berlin, I knew I was going to leave Berlin at the end of those three years, or at least I was trying to. That was the plan because the same moment that I signed a lease for three years for that studio space, my partner also signed up for or like enrolled in a three year PhD program. So 
And you know, I had been fed up with the city for ages and I was ready to leave. <laughs> so once the YouTube videos started rolling, I said, okay, I'm going to sort of, like maybe this is a way I can make money out in the countryside. You know, like let me start building up, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of a thing. Like while I'm still in Berlin, let me try and build something so that I have a little bit of income when we move. Now, this income was like 300 bucks a month or something like that. Like it wasn't much. Obviously, I have to throw out my privilege here. I have no kids. My partner had like, we moved here with his job. We signed the contract for this house without his job, but luckily by the time we moved here, he had a job. It's not super well paying job, but it can at least pay our rent and our life expenses. Um, so that was covered, blah, 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 all the privileges. Um, and I thought, okay, you know what? Now is the time. And I had all these conversations with my partner about it. You know, he's, he's really supportive of me. Yeah, and so that's what started YouTube. Um, I did, yeah, like, so there was all that planning. Like, you know, I started doing these online classes. I started filming them with my friend Bianca because, um, you know, maybe at that point I already, we knew we were moving. Um, so that's why we moved, or not why we moved, that's how we moved. And if you wanna know why we moved, I really wanna move on, but I do have a long thread on my Instagram about like the why in my Instagram highlights. So I'll just, I'll link it or whatever. Um, you can find out that there. Okay, we need to move on. I'm sorry, I'm very long-winded. Um, I'm gonna probably cut this down. Gosh, did I even answer your question? Do I earn more from social media or pottery sales? I don't earn very much from pottery sales. I also don't put a lot of effort into it though. So like if I were to spend more time making and like promoting and you know, making marketable things, um, yeah, I could make a living off of pottery sales, but I don't and I don't want to. <laughs> Do we wanna talk about money? I think I'm very happy to share that aspect of it, but that wasn't a question. So I'm not gonna answer that in this video. If you want me to talk about my different income streams and like how that all works, let me know. You can write it down in the comments, um, but I'm gonna try and stick to your questions. You little guy. Gosh, I'm whipping through these. This is fun. They're so cute. At what point did you know you were ready to do pottery full time? I never had a normal full time job. I was a day, uh, what do you call it? Day job? You call it a day job? But it was never like a nine to five. I never, I never had a nine to five job because I knew that I was going to make this my career. <laughs> like literally from when I graduated school, I knew I was gonna make this my career. I mean, not necessarily pottery, but like art. Cause I graduated with a general art degree. So I was determined, I always worked like 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week kind of a thing. Um, and I never pursued any career path outside of this. I mean, partially it was because I moved to Germany. And actually, let me just bring that into the next question, which is how did I come to live in Germany? I moved to Germany when I was 24. I met my partner who's German the summer after I graduated from college. So, in college, I had an awesome job as a book conservator. And actually I thought that, I mean, I said I would never get a normal job, but like that was gonna be the closest thing to a normal job. I was gonna do that, you know, as my profession and then do art on the side as, you know, whatever. Cause I really loved book, book conservation. We would work with these very old books and newspapers and things. Anyway, doesn't matter. So I was um, having that sort of career. But um, as you can imagine, graduating with an art degree and trying to pursue a job in book conservation without a library degree, mind you, I was struggling to get a job. I did get an interview for a book binding place at Cornell, which I was very, like basically all my eggs were in that basket. And I said, if I don't get this Cornell job, I'm going to travel. Because I'd already been doing some woofing and I'd been doing road trips. I was like, you know, classic, like hippie college kid, like going on road trips whenever you possibly can. And um, doing woof, do you guys know what woofing is? Woofing is, um, 
Worldwide Organization of Organic Farms. So basically it's a um, work stay kind of thing. I've also done um, work away and help X, um, but yeah. So I decided to go woofing because I did not get that job. And I also, because I was working for the university, I lost my job as soon as I graduated. Therefore I couldn't pay for my apartment. So I lost my apartment. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was like basically out of desperation and just, you know, living the dream. I decided to go traveling. And it was at one of the first farms, one of the very first farms in uh, August or September or something. So like right at the end of that summer that I met Jonas and Jonas is my partner. We are now married. So that's how I came to live in Germany. I mean, like for two years, so between age, so this would have been 2012 is when I graduated between 2012, so when I was 22 and 24, I was back and forth. So this was like peak uh, nomadic lifestyle. Um, Jonas and I, we, like he could come to the US for three months, I could go to Europe for three months, um, you know, without a visa. And uh, we would just come back and forth. I think I went over to Europe for, times or something. One time I actually was able to get a visa, so I was able to stay for six months. Um, and then I would always come back to uh, my college town, which is Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> to get a job and make some money as quickly as possible before I had to go again. And it was always, you know, minimum wage jobs, whatever. After two years of doing this, also like I couldn't really do art while, I mean, I was like journaling and stuff, but I couldn't really do art while I was traveling so much because um, at that point I had firmly launched myself into craft. So I was, at that point I was really fed up with it. We had these dreams of buying some land, getting a farm. So we tried to figure out ways that we could be together, but also, you know, settle down kind of a thing. Um, and we originally pursued the idea of him coming to the U S because as I mentioned, I had, well, I didn't have that university book conservation job anymore, but I was working for the Wisconsin Historical Society. So I did have a book conservation job, which I loved. And it was part-time, so I could, you know, I had my little art studio on the side and I was just really happy. It was minimum wage, still fine, but I was happy I was able to pay my bills. And at the time, I think Madison rent prices were more reasonable than they are now. Um, so the idea was for him to come over um, we even looked into getting, like we weren't married at the time, obviously, and we were looking into getting the marriage, li like getting married so he could come to the U.S. Um, we also looked into jobs and all this other stuff. Um, but I ended up getting really disillusioned with my country because um, it was all just getting very expensive. You know, $2,000 for us was an unheard of <laughs> amount of money. You know, I was paying like 300 bucks a month in rent or something like that at the time, $2,000. I never had had $2,000 in my bank account at that time. So, <laughs> and that would have been the visa costs. I think you may also need to hire a lawyer. I'm not sure um, how it all works, but um, it just seems impossible. And I was just getting really fed up with, you know, these two years, and we just wanted to be together, you know, we were freaking in love. And um, so we thought, okay, why don't I come to Germany? And that visa was $94 or euros, I guess. Um, and so I was like, okay, we can do that. We can make that work. Um, and yeah, so we got married. We had a visa marriage. Um, we were together for two years before the marriage. We are still married today. So it is a real marriage, but it was like the whole reason we got married was for a visa. I have no idea if we'd actually be married right now if it weren't for the visa. And I was 24 years old when we got married. So I felt young, young. I felt like <laughs> we were doing something naughty basically. But no, it was good. It was good. Um, and yeah, so that's how I ended up living in Germany. So we moved basically immediately to Berlin and this move out here was the first time we left Berlin. So that's how I came to live in Germany. Okay, one more long-winded question before we get to rapid fire. And these two questions are from the same person and they're very related, so I'm going to just combine them. 
that's tips on how to stay consistent with your art practice when you're your own boss, and is it difficult to stay motivated slash structure your day in your current setup? Yes. <laughs> Wait, let me, let me get some clay. Let me get, I'm gonna make more Christmas trees. By the way, my studio is a freaking mess. You see all this clay and this is just like all the stuff from my glaze room is currently in this room. So yeah. For those of you who don't know, my current setup is that I live right above me. <laughs> my studio is in the basement of my apartment. So my partner goes to work nine to five and basically I'm alone. He does work from home some days, but I'm basically home alone in my apartment slash studio all day. And honestly, it's a freaking dream. <laughs> um, I do get lonely. I do for sure get lonely. Um, but honestly, I really enjoyed sharing a studio space, but it was a little overwhelming. Um, I mean, technically I owned the space, but there were always people in it um, and it never really felt like mine. Getting a place that was just for me, I don't know if I'm gonna wanna do it forever. Like, I think in my dream world, I have like one studio mate or maybe two studio mates, not like 20 people. <laughs> Ooh, this is a wonky one. I'm trying to not make them too thick in any parts because I'm not gonna hollow them. I'm gonna like just let them dry. So, ooh, you got wonky. You very wonky. Okay, we're gonna stop this one. So we have a grotesquely large apartment, three bedrooms for two people and a dog. Peanut literally has her own bedroom. She has taken what is sort of like the um, storage slash closet room slash whatever. We got a new couch and we put our old couch in there and she sleeps on the old couch now. So she has her own room. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we have a uh, office room, which is freaking awesome. So when I'm working, I'm either down here or I'm in my office and uh, I, office I share with my partner. Um, but it is so fucking luxurious and I know once again how privileged I am to have so much space but honestly this is also just like why I moved to the countryside anyway that wasn't your question your question was work-life balance or was it work-life balance structuring my day um yeah this is hard um for sure and like not having that outside accountability is hard. I do really love it on the days that my partner works from home because I am able to like focus a little bit better when he's there. But I am fairly self-motivated. I'm not a perfectionist by any means, but I have a lot of ideas. And um, I guess if I'm a perfectionist about anything, it's like the amount of things that I wanna do <laughs> because I just like get annoyed that I can't fit more stuff into my week. So it's really like looking at my list of things that I wanna do and being annoyed that I haven't done them. These things really drive me to work. And also getting like, what do you call it? Like outside, like other outside accountability sources, like you guys, Every Wednesday I upload a YouTube video. I have skipped a Wednesday or two here or there because I'm not trying to kill myself, but you know, instead of shooting this Q&A, I could have uh, just not had a video this week and that would have been fine and you guys would have totally understood. And like, it's not like, I mean, come on. Every Wednesday I have a YouTube video going live. Therefore, I have to sit my ass down today and do something for YouTube. And I have to sit my ass up there later today and you know edit and, and upload and everything because that's just like a promise that I made to myself. So I guess what I'm saying is find these kind of like non-negotiables in your life or just make them up, you know, just make up some non-negotiables, make up some things that you have to do. And keep in mind when you're making up these non-negotiables that you are human and don't, do not beat yourself up if you miss them sometimes. Everyone deserves some flexibility. The shit happens in life and whatever. Um, but on like a normal timeline, make them non-negotiable. 
you know? Like, I don't really need any motivation to want to create things. So that just kind of comes on its own. But there's plenty of things about my job that are like literally just like a job, you know? Like, I'm not living the friggin' dream, y'all. Like, sorry, I'm not trying to complain here. I'm just saying like, please don't idealize my life. Um, and there is times that I need motivation and there is times that I don't want to work. 100%. I just try and do it, like basically like capitalize on when I am in the right mood to do things. I always have lists of things that I want to do. So like, if you don't want to do the thing that's on today's to-do list, don't. And just do one of the other things on the to-do list so you still feel like you get stuff done. Gosh, I don't know if anything of this is helpful for you. One thing that I do have is a very complicated kind of like calendar and like checklist type system for making YouTube videos, making pottery and blah, blah, blah. Like my life, you know, social media. Also home projects are on there. So if you're interested in that, I can share that with you. Like I am quite proud <laughs> of, I'm a very type A person if you haven't gotten that by now. And I really love lists. So if you want to see my lists, I'm happy to share them with you. Another kind of barrier or um, kind of rule that I set for myself is I try and make at least one thing a week, one new thing a week. Probably this is sounds like very little for someone who makes their living off of pottery because, you know, I'm doing a lot of other stuff. Oh, this one's just a struggle. I'm focusing too much on what I'm trying to say because I can't figure out what I'm trying to say. But things like that, like saying like, I'm going to make at least one thing, one new thing a week, or I'm gonna fire once every whatever, um, two weeks or something. Like, I don't know. I don't know, whatever you do. Setting aside time for creativity because we are creatives, that is crucial. And being my own boss, I don't know what to say about that. You just have to, I've, I've found that being the boss of me was a hell of a lot easier than being the boss of others. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> okay, rapid fire. How is your ficus elastica doing? She's doing beautifully. If y'all don't know the story, we moved here in March last year. Moving from Berlin, it's like a nine hour trip by car anyway. Basically like we hired movers to deal with all of our crap and I put the plants in with the movers. They said that they would be fine. The thing is the movers, we loaded it up one day and then they drove down, overnighted in uh, down here and obviously everything in the car froze, including my plants. So he pretty much died. Um, I thought he was dead dead and lost all of its leaves one by one, slowly but surely. But because it was a tree and because it was so healthy before the move, it had some life left in half of the stem and the roots. So it bloomed. Actually, stay tuned because she's getting a new home. That's actually, I think gonna be next. Is that next week's video? No, that's next, next week's video. She's getting a new home. Stay tuned. How long has Peanut been a member of our family? So I adopted her. Well, we started the adoption process when I was sick in bed from bronchitis, I was the sickest I've ever been. And I was bored to death because I was in bed for three days and I started to look up doggies on the internet. And I really wanted a dog. I always wanted a dog. I grew up with a dog and you know, I just love dogs so much. So I started the adoption process when I was sick in bed. We got her a couple months later. She's from Montenegro from this amazing, um, nonprofit, totally volunteer run organization called Stray Aid. Yeah, so that was four years ago. And she was one and a half when we got her. Do we also like drawing, sewing, knitting? I love all crafts. Honestly, give me a freaking craft. Give me all the crafts, especially the lady crafts and like the kind of non-essentials. Like when I was doing metalsmithing, I was uh, very interested in ornamentation. I am currently crocheting what should be a blanket. I'm just making a bunch of granny squares right now. And I love it. I sew, I'm not very good at sewing clothes, but I'm trying to get better. I sew, you know, basically everything. Um, I'm also just a cheap ass, you know, and I like to make things myself. 
So give me all the craftsmen, like I love them. Tips on trimming bottoms. Um, yes, go and buy my wheel class. <laughs> Shameless plug, but um, if you want like a very thorough explanation of every step to make pottery, go check out that class. And I show you in that class a flat bottom and then a ring foot um, bottom. Yeah, there's a thousand tips. Biggest ceramic piece I've made is definitely the table slash planter that I made for my bathroom recently. I have a video on the whole process, so you can watch it there. Pottery wheel I would recommend for a beginner, this wheel. This is the Shimpo RK55. It's the only brand of wheel that I've ever owned, so I can't say that it's like the best, best wheel, but it's the cheapest, at least that's available in my area, um, and it's just fine. There's no reason why you need a fancier wheel than this one. I mean, other wheels are, um, can be quieter. They can also handle heavier loads, but I've never gotten to the limit of this wheel yet. So, I mean, it will slow down, but it won't stop or like it doesn't slow down enough to like throw you off. So yeah. How do you glaze the bottoms of your mugs as well without destroying your kiln shelf? I don't. I never glaze the bottom of my pottery. If you're making ceramics, so like non uh, vessel type pots, you could use one of these tools to elevate your pot from the kiln shelf, but you are gonna get marks from where it's touching your clay. If you're making something like a bell, you can have a little sticky up thing that the bell can sit on top of. If you're making beads, you can put them on some nichrome wire. Otherwise, wipe the bottoms. What don't I like in pottery? Glazing. So I think that's a good note to end on. I didn't answer all of your questions, partially because some of them were really niche or technical. So I hope that that was interesting for you. Thank you for indulging me. Yeah, so I'm gonna go work on the glaze room now and y'all will see that next week. So I hope y'all have a wonderful and creative day. Bye friends.